All right, amen. Well, Matthew 16, 18 says this, and I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, before we get into what I really want to talk about, which is the promise of God building his church and that the gates of hell will not prevail against it, uh, let me just first uh, quickly address this passage is pretty confusing, especially for us Protestants, because it's one of our, um, one of the Catholics' favorite verses to use to um, you know, teach on papal authority in the, in the apostolic uh, progression from Peter, they say on. That's where they get their idea of where the papacy comes from, okay? Um, and, and I just want you to know, you don't need to be afraid of this verse, okay? Like, have you ever been in a conversation with a Catholic brother and they've brought this up and you didn't know how to answer them? You, you don't need to be afraid of this verse, even if Jesus is referring to Jesus when he says this rock, which is certainly possible, right? Calling Peter, renaming him, rock, right? A synonym to rock. And then saying this rock, I'll build the church. Uh, It's very possible he is referring to Peter, that Peter was uh, the foundation. Jesus is the cornerstone and he's building his church on the foundation of the prophets and the apostles. And so it's very possible that that's what he's referring to, but it doesn't mean at all that there has to be a progression of that. And it doesn't mean at all that in the specific geography of Rome, that whoever is the pastor of the church in Rome is the pastor of the church of the whole world. There's no real logical basis for that to uh, just progress in that way or based on the geography of Rome itself to place that as the pastor of the whole church. Okay, so you don't need to be afraid of that. And so hopefully that removes any distractions that are in your mind if you have that kind of a, a background or if you've been in a conversation and it frees you to see what an incredible promise this is. That Jesus is saying, I will build my church. Who will build it? Jesus will build it. What is he building? His church, his body, his bride, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I'm I'm sure somebody else has taught you guys this before, but um, it it took me a little while in my Christian walk to realize that, you know, the gates of hell won't won't prevail against it. it means that the church is on the offensive right? They're battering the gates down. The gates, gates are a defensive thing. Walls are a thing to protect what's inside. And Jesus is saying, I will, my church will on the offenses, uh, offense dominate the kingdom of darkness, I think. Dominate um, Satan and, and who the whole power lies under the world, under the control of the evil one. That his church will prevail. That is a wonderful promise. And so my goal is to send you guys out of here. It's a fairly modest one, okay? It's to send you guys out of here into the new year, energized and encouraged to serve in your local church. Woohoo! <laughs> Just what you wanted, right? Just what you wanted here. That's, that, that's my goal, okay? That's my, that's my goal is that you will leave here energized and encouraged to serve in your local church. Now, um, let's just quickly recap a few of the promises we've been through, okay? And here's what I want to do. I want us to see that in all of these promises, there's a theme. And what that theme is, is that each specific flavor of promise leads us to a similar conclusion, and that's that your good works, your labor, your believing is not in vain, Okay, the image that I like to use, the image that's been really helpful to me is when God gives us a promise of something, and I've already kind of covered this. I just want to cover it again to make sure we get it. When God gives us a promise of something, it's always meant to drive us into faithful, fruitful laboring, right? I think we rest and receive the promise of salvation. Okay, I'm not saying you're laboring for your salvation, but these precious and very great promises have been given to us. And then Peter says, do you remember what he says? For this very very reason. Make every effort. So let me explain how this works. If, if I, I went on a hike with Caleb today, and it was a pretty short hike, thankfully. Okay, I'm getting, um, getting older. I was still uh, kind of tired. But if I was standing at the base of like a 14er, and I hadn't prepared at all, right? I hadn't uh, done any training. I don't know if you ever hiked a 14er. It's pretty intense. It's like harder than you think it'll be. You know, <laughs> you're halfway up and you're like, I gotta go how far still, okay? It's pretty intense and you haven't trained at all. You haven't thought about it at all. You're not wearing the right shoes. Let's say you didn't bring any water. You rolled your ankle getting to the trailhead and you know, you're just like, you're, you're struggling, okay? You're really struggling. And you're at the base of this mountain and, 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 you're, and, and you know, let's say God's there with you. Okay, this is just an imaginary story. God's there with you. Um, what's gonna motivate you to climb that mountain? 
Is God saying, get to the top, there's going to be a reward for you at the top? Is that going to be the thing that really motivates you to climb the mountain as you're looking up at this thing, knowing everything that you've got going against you? Or is it God saying, I promise you, if you believe me, you'll get to the top, right? Which one of those things is going to be more powerful in your Christian life? And that's a lot like what the Christian life is, right? Like we're called into some pretty just crazy, gnarly stuff, right? We're called into holiness and godliness and fleeing from sin and growing in love. And these things that we look and down at ourselves and spiritually, it's like we've got a rolled ankle, you know? Spiritually, we've got this flesh and we're infirm and we're prone to pride and arrogance and sin and addictions. And we're like, oh God, how am I ever going to make it? And what the promises of God are meant to do is they're meant to be like God saying, if you'll, if, you'll just, if you'll believe me, if you'll go, you'll get there. And that's what it's meant to do. It's meant to get you to take that step and start to obey and follow and trust because of the promises you make every effort. So think back through the promises. What are the promises we've covered? We've covered the promise of salvation. You think you're too weak and sinful to be saved, but God says, actually, my design in salvation is to display my free grace and how glorious it is. And so the more sinful you are, the more clearly I display my free grace and glory. And I promise, I, I, I promise everyone who believes will be saved. And so you take that first step. Amen? Does that mean you believe? Or the knowledge of God. Maybe you just feel like you're too dumb. <laughs> You feel like you're too distracted. You're not self-disciplined enough to know God that way, to even experience God that way. You're too distracted by your phone and your computer and the world and, the, and, and, and your college classes and everything like that. And what God says is he says, everybody in the new covenant will know me from the least to the greatest. And you say, okay, if everyone will know you, I will believe you and I'll step into that. It leads you into action, right? Or assurance of good. You remember that? We were talking about, you know, you think life is too hard, my life's too messed up, man. My family's too evil. Things are too dark. There's too much sin. I've got too much bad in my life. There's no way this thing's working out for good. And God says he will work it out for good. And so what do you do? You endure. No hardship is able to make your faith in vain. It's, it's not in vain. Or what we covered this morning, the assurance of reward. You think you have too little gifts to offer, right? You, you're not this super awesome preacher guy. That's just not who you are. You don't even like people, right? You're like, how the heck am I supposed to bless God's church? What's the point? How do I do this? And then you read it, and God promises that from a good heart, from a pure motive, from uh, right intentions, even if it's uh, just a tiny bit, he rewards every single one of those works. And so that promise is meant to drive you in to trust that none of your hardship and labor and service, uh, none, none of your um, good works are done in vain. And now what do we have? We have the assurance of victory. But it's an assurance of victory that's really specific. It's an assurance of victory that God will build his church. He will build his church. Jesus is accomplishing all of his holy will on this earth through his church. And he will build his church and hell will not prevail against it. And what that ought to do when you believe that and understand that is it ought to lead you to labor and love your local church more than you ever have before. Uh, um, here's, here's a couple things. Here, so here's what I want, where I want to go with this. How I'm going to try to motivate you in that and encourage you in that is, is just thinking about how does this promise, how, how does this um, help me to be a, a better churchman? Okay, or woman? How does this help me to better love and serve Christ's church? Well, one of the things we have to realize is that Jesus is accomplishing all of his will through the church. Okay, so Romans 16, 20. I think this is a really helpful verse. Uh, in, in gen, well, really quick, in Genesis, right, what do we have? We, we say that the seed of the woman will crush the serpent's head. Do you remember that? And who's the seed of the woman? Jesus, right? Jesus is the seed of the woman that crushes the serpent's head and bruises his heel. But then we get to Romans 16, 20, and we read something that just kind of gives it a little different flavor that I think gives insight into what the church is. This is Romans 16, 20. It says, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The God of peace will soon crush Satan. Who's Satan? He's the serpent from of old. Under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. 
What's he saying there? He's saying that you really are Christ's body in a very real sense. So that your victory in the church, souls coming to know him is a plundering the strong man's house. That's a victory over Satan. When you evangelize, you are crushing Satan under your feet. That, uh, that, that you know, Genesis 3 is coming true there of crushing the serpent. Every time you serve and pour your heart out and a message is preached that builds up the saints, Satan and his lies are crushed through the church. Jesus is fulfilling that promise. Jesus is accomplishing all of his holy will through the church. The church is his plan for filling the earth with his glory. So how is Jesus building his church? How is he doing this? He's promised that he's going to do it, but how is he doing it? You probably already know this, but let's just cover it again. Ephesians 4, 11 through 13, he is building his church through his church. <laughs> He's building his church through the body. This is what it says. He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So that's not saying that he has some, a few special offices, pastor, apostle, teacher, evangelist, and they're the ones that do the ministry. That's saying that their job is to equip the saints and the saints do the ministry. Do you see that? Read it again if you didn't see it. It says, he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to do what? To equip the saints for what? For the saints to do the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith. What, what that means is that you are the ones that are building the church. You're the ones building the church. Um, what I'm saying here is not that you need to go on staff that you need to be a pastor, you need to be evangelist. not what I'm saying at all. You, you can build up the church by being an engineer or an actuary or a stay-at-home mom or anything that, you know, any godly profession that you want to do. You can build up the church. What, I, what I'm saying is that God has given you unique gifts that he expects you to use for the work of ministry, and part of that is building up the church to accomplish his will in the world. And guys, it was not that long ago that I was sitting in those seats listening to other people right, preach at a winter retreat. Any church, any church that doesn't think about the next generation and doesn't consider that you guys are going to be the leaders very soon, you're going to be the ones that are discipling the people under, you know, that there's going to be a whole new set of people in this room in four years and somebody's going to have to teach them God's word. Somebody's going to have to actually sit down with them and know their lives and know what they're dealing with in a way that can't just be done from the pulpit ministry and is going to have to love them and demonstrate the Christian life. And guess who it's going to be? It's going to be you. In a very short amount of time, you are going to be the ones who God has gifted and he's equipping and things like that for a purpose, which is building up his church. And if you're going to do that well, if you're going to be passionate about that, you have to have one thing deep down in your, in your bones, and that is that God's church is something incredibly glorious. I, I love, uh, I've only read half of it, but I love the half that I've read of C.S. Lewis's screw tape letters. And he's just got this, yeah, I will. Someday, brother, someday. <laughs> and he's got this one scene where, you know, the guy that's coming to the Lord is, is going to church. And he's like telling, I forgot his name, Worm Tongue or something like that. That's, that's Tolkien. That's right. <laughs> Wormwood. Wormwood. Thank you. Different worm. Okay. <laughs> Different worm noun. Okay. And, and Wormwood is trying to figure out, what do I do? How do I get this guy to, you know, not do, do this thing, right? And, and he's saying, here's what you need to do. When he goes to church, he needs to look at that old lady, right? That's kind of mean and sings off key and has her shirt on backwards on accident and, and be like, that's the church, right? You, he needs to look at him at the grocer, that guy that's super normal and didn't treat him that well last time and was kind of in a bad mood and be like, this is it? This is the church? There, there's a temptation when we go to church and we're around sinful, normal people that we look around at these people and we're like, this is the bride of Christ. This is what you purchased with your precious blood. And we need to actually resist that temptation. We, we actually need to resist only seeing what's worst in one another. That's what Wormwood's trying to do. 
He's trying to only get you to see the worst and the sin and the weird idiosyncrasies of people rather than seeing the church of God as the bride of Christ, rather than seeing it as a group of people that he is redeeming and cleansing and purifying for himself to become something that is incredibly glorious. It's, you, you know, it's almost like the church is so glorious that the Bible can't use enough metaphors to describe it right? It's like the church is a vine that's incredibly fruitful. The church is an army that conquers. The church is a bride to God. The church is a temple where God dwells. The church is a royal priesthood, a holy nation to declare the excellencies of God. Whoa, you know, when you read the Bible about what the church is, it should just shock you. And sometimes we look up and I think we see our local church congregations and we kind of feel a little bit gypped, right? Like what, this, this is it? But uh, the church is the thing, apparently, that is vindicating God's wisdom to demonic powers in heaven that doubt his wisdom. I'll back that up, all right? I don't get, this is from Mark Dever's book, uh, The Gospel Made Visible. This is what Ephesians 3, 8 through 10 says. To me, though I am the very least of the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God, who created all things, so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Now, I don't think he's talking about angels there because he's having to prove his wisdom to them. Right? I think the angels know his wisdom. They glorify and they rejoice when Jesus comes. They say, don't worship me. God alone deserves to be worshiped. They know the glory of God. So who are these authorities in the heavenly places that God is trying to demonstrate and prove his manifold wisdom to? It must be demonic forces. It must be the prince of Persia that we read about in Daniel. It must be these dark demonic forces in the heavenly realms that apparently do the same thing that we're all tempted to do which is look at the church and say, that's what you died for? Wow, it doesn't seem very wise to me, right? They look at all of the Old Testament, Israel's ups and downs, mostly downs, and they're like, what are you doing? And God's like, just you wait, just you wait. And in the church, apparently, as it is beautified and as it is cleansed by Christ and as it grows and as it builds one another up in this most holy love, it is something is happening in the heavenly places that we aren't even aware of. <laughs> like things that we're not even thinking about, like demons apparently mocking God. It's insane to even, I don't know why he doesn't just banish them to hell forever. Are being vind- God is being vindicated against them through the local church. Guys, the local church is much more glorious than you ever could have thought it was. Do you think of it that way? Do you think of the local church as the primary means which God is blessing the world and vindicating his wisdom and displaying his glory? If you don't, right, then serving your local church is going to feel like drudgery right? If you view the local church as the place where you have friends and you like these people, so you show up, and and I'm not talking about your campus fellowship here. I'm not talking about your midweek. I'm I'm talking about your Sunday morning from the most gray-haired to to the youngest believer that's there. I'm, I'm talking about the church. I'm talking about the pastors and the deacons and the people that serve and everyone together, this body collectively that God has given you to run and serve for the rest of your life to get to heaven together with. I'm talking about your local church and CF ought to be a part of that, but it is not that. Do you have that high of a view of those people? Or are they a place where you go just for friendship, right? Are they a place that you go just for entertainment maybe? Is it a place you go just because you're supposed to go there? You're like, yeah, churches are a dime a dozen. I'll just go here, I'll go there, whatever. Do you have a low view of God's church? If you do, uh, serving God's church, using your gifts, this, this promise won't even really matter to you that much. Great, he's building his church. It's not that big of a deal. But if you are kind of like this guy that I'm about to read to you um, named Henry Barrow, who, by the way, went to prison because of his love for the church, serving God's church, if you understand the church like he understood it, then serving the church would be a glorious thing. So here's what he says. He says, the holy army of saints is marshaled here in earth by these officers under the conduct of their glorious emperor Christ, that victorious and true Michael. 
Thus it marcheth in this most heavenly order and gracious array against all enemies, both bodily and ghostly, peaceable in itself as Jerusalem, terrible unto them as an army with banners, triumphing over their tyranny with patience, their cruelty with meekness, and over death itself with dying. Thus, through the blood of that spotless lamb and that word of their testimony, they are more than conquerors, bruising the head of the serpent. Yea, though the power of the, through the power of the word, they have the power to cast down Satan like lightning, to tread upon serpents and scorpions, to cast down strongholds and everything that exalteth itself against God. The gates of hell and all the principalities and powers of the world shall not prevail against it. <laughs> If you can understand the church like that, your life will be awesome. <laughs> what am I a part of? What have I found myself in? What have I been saved into? This is not mundane at all, right? Your eyes will be open. And you'll be shocked that you found yourself in an army that's terrible with banners advancing against a demonic horde with the guarantee of victory. That is awesome. That's better than any movie you're going to watch this year, I promise. Better than Die Hard, better than Braveheart. It's better. It's awesome. If you will understand the incredible glory of God's church, you will happily serve it. You'll happily lay down your life for it. And when you read that Jesus will give you the victory, and when you read that you will conquer, all it'll do is get you more fired up to get in there and use your gifts to serve with everything you've got. What we are building is glorious. And what we are building is assured. And, 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 what, and let's just, now I just want to go through three things, just three ways that I think that'll transform your life. If you grasp that what you're building is glorious and what you're building is assured, that it's a promise, one of the things that'll change is it'll change the way that you rest. So this conference is all about rest. That's why we're here, right? You're here to rest. But we need to be careful as Christians that we don't rest like the world rests, okay? Here's how the world rests. I'm going to work five days starting on Monday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, so that I get to rest for two days, Saturday and Sunday, right? Most of your coworkers live for the weekend, they hate their work. They don't feel like what they're doing is glorious or meaningful. Or if they do, maybe they're not sure they're gonna accomplish it. So they have a sense of despair or they don't know why it really matters. And so they work so that they can stop working. It's kind of a depressing thing, really. And they're losing out on that deal. Five days of work to get two days of rest. That's kind of a sad existence. How should your work be radically different? Um, and how should your rest be radically different then? Well, um, what, what we do, and I'm not talking about an eternal rest here, okay? I'm talking about the kind of rest that we're doing here, where we're resting here for a few days, okay? What we do is we rest, <clears throat> excuse me, because what we are building is so glorious and is so lovely and is so mighty and is so wonderful that we can't wait to get back to building it. We rest in order to work. Does that make sense? There's other reasons too. We rest to imitate God who rests on the seventh day. We rest to worship God. We rest just to obey God because he commanded us to rest. But also, I think there's something wrong if you don't rest because you want to keep building and you want to be more fruitful, right? I, does that make sense? It just, it just a, it's a subtle mind shift, but it's, I think it's actually really important in the Christian life. We rest because we so believe in what we're building, because we love it, because it matters, because it's a big deal. So that I can, I rest so that I can pour my life out for my wife and my kids, right? So that I can build into them something better than I had that'll go a thousand generation and build God's church. I rest, right? So that I can pour my heart out from this pulpit and have some energy to bless you because I believe in the church and I believe in you and I want to be able to serve you and bless you with whatever I have. I rest so that I can be more fruitful in this work. And so what that means is what we should do is you should stop thinking about Monday as the beginning of your week. It's actually just not true, right? Sunday is the beginning of your week. And here's, here's a question. Have you guys, I, I, just a, a genuine, I would like feedback on, I would like participation. Um, ha, have you felt rested? I hope you have. Have you felt rested on this trip? Have you? 
Yes, good. Okay, we try to organize it and design. I think they do a really careful job of making sure you have time. We're not just packing your day with activities so that you can rest. Do you feel, because of that rest, more motivated, energized, and ready to go back and serve in whatever context you have already, even if we ended it right now? Yes. Amen, you do, right? What if I told you that you could have a mini version of this every week? Amen. That'd be pretty awesome, right? <laughs> right? Like, what if you took the rest you're feeling now, the joy in the Lord, that you took time out of your busy schedule to just be with God and worship God and hear God's words preached and worship with the saints all together, uh, and you feel rested and ready to go, what if you did that every week? Oh, wait, we do do that every week, don't we? On Sunday, right? What if you thought of your Sundays as a rest so that you could work hard, Monday through Saturday, the rest of the week, to build God's kingdom? What if you thought about Sundays as you're sitting under the teaching of God's word to be filled with faith and courage for the fight ahead, and you think about your day not as a day just to indulge your fleshly pleasures? I'm not saying it's wrong to watch a football game. That's not what I'm saying. But what if you primarily and fundamentally think about that Sunday as a day of getting with God and worshiping and resting like you've done in this conference so that you can go out and you can build and you can work and you can enjoy uh, building God's kingdom? That's what I think the Christian have actually thought about Sunday for most of church history, right? That they've thought about Sunday as an incredibly valuable time of resting and being with God and worshiping God and being filled up so that Monday through Saturday, you can go and you can serve and love and rejoice and, and build God's kingdom. If you understand that what you're building is incredibly valuable, I think you'll be much more likely to do that on Sunday. I think it'd be much more likely to rest well so that you can labor well Monday through Saturday. And I would just encourage you to do that. The second thing, the promise of victory, I think will do for you. If you grasp it, if you believe it, if you believe in the glory of his church and the promise of the victory, is I think it'll enable you to handle hiccups and hardships that come along with your local church. I'm a pastor, all right? Your pastor knows what's wrong with your church better than anyone. Like, you guys probably think you know the things that are wrong with your church. You, you probably don't actually, right? There's probably things going on that you have no idea about. Like, like, like this world is, is just hard. Things don't go according to plan. You know what I'm saying? Uh, and when you're a pastor, especially, it seems like you just see some of those things in the church, some of that hardship and some of the fights and some of the tension, and some of the things that just don't seem to go like they ought to go. Like, why can't we all just get along and love and serve and go after Christ? Why can't we just flee from sin? Why is this still an issue? What are we doing here? You see those things. And if you have the promise of victory, what I think it does is it enables you not to give up. It enables you to continue to cling to this promise that in the end, God's church will be victorious. Now, that doesn't mean your local church or your local ministry will, this isn't a promise that for sure Campus Fellowship is gonna be victorious for you know, X amount of time or something like that. But in the long run, it's still significant because we're all small streams that are feeding into a giant river and that giant river will be victorious. And that's an incredibly good and strong encouragement. And if we don't get that, um, I, I think we'll just be super prone to giving up. We'll be really prone to hopping from church to church to church, right? Because we've uh, kind of got this way of thinking about what God's will is. I call it an open door theology. That is, I think we should just totally abandon that. Like, I think we should just totally abandon this idea of God opening or closing doors. Not because it can't ever be useful, but because I think what it ends up turning into is when something's really hard, we just say, ah, oh, that door was closed. Must not have been God's will. You know what I'm saying? Like, well, I don't know, man. I read my Old Testament and they went through some really hard stuff. I read the New Testament. They went through some really hard stuff and it was still God's will that they go forward, right? Like think about Nehemiah and Ezra. If you don't know the story, Nehemiah and Ezra, they are um, you know, leaders in God's church and, they, and they're coming down out of Israel in order to rebuild the temple. And they go through some incredible hardship, like literally people trying to kill them. Right? I'm pretty sure at that point, you guys would be like, or not you, many people would be like, yeah, door shut. People tried to kill me. <laughs> Must not have been God's will. 
They had people plotting against them, trying to trick them to sin and go into the temple when they shouldn't, right? They had people slandering them and saying all kinds of false things about them, trying to stop the work. And then guess what happened? The work stopped for 16 years. Like another king, uh, you know, the first king said, yeah, build it. And another king came along and said, nope, stop building right now. And they stopped for a 10-year period and a six-year period. And, and man, if, that, if, if you have an open-door theology, you're thinking this temple is not God's will. It's way too hard. If you think about God's will only in terms of what comes easy for me, then you're going to abandon your local church the second it gets hard. And guess what? It's going to get hard because we're sinners. It's going to be hard. It's probably going to be harder than you think it is. People are probably going to offend you. People are probably going to hurt your feelings. Those things are probably going to happen. And that does not mean that it's not God's will for you to be there. Just like it was definitely God's will for Nehemiah and Ezra to be building that temple. How did they continue to build in the face of all that difficulty? In the face of people trying to kill them, laboring with one hand, you know, with a sword in the other, their homes aren't even built, their families don't even know what they did with their families. There's incredible sin in the camp. Like people are marrying foreigners and doing the same thing they did before. It's like just incredible hardship. How did they continue? Well, um, we know it tells us Ezra 5, verses 1 through 5 says, Now the prophets, Haggai and Zechariah, the son of Edo, this is after they stopped the work prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel who was over them. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, the son of Josedach, arose and began to rebuild the house of God after they'd stopped, that is in Jerusalem. And the prophets of God were with them, supporting them. Do you see that? The prophets of God, they're speaking and they're communicating what God's will is. Where do we have that? We have that in God's word, right? God is speaking and communicating to us what his will is in this word, regardless of how difficult it is on the outside. And you know what God's word clearly says almost everywhere? It's that you would love your fellow Christian, that you would love your local church, that you would pour your life out for the people in your local church and use your specific gifts to serve and serve and serve and serve. That's how you know that's God's will for you because it says it. Not because it's easy, not because everything's going well, not because it's super fun, because it says it. And the promise of God's victory that it will be accomplished means even when things are really hard in your local church, God has promised that it's going to work out, that it's, that it's going to happen. Maybe not again in your local church, but in the long term. And you just have to do your part to be faithful like they did. It says this in verse 5, But the eye of their God was on the elders of the Jews, and they did not stop them until the report should reach Darius, and then an answer be returned by letter concerning it. God worked it out. They were able to work and serve and build. Knowing the promise of God's victory in building the church, I think it will enable you to keep building with a faithful hope and trust even when it's really difficult, right? Even when things don't seem to be working out well, you're being faithful to what God told you to do. And then I think the last thing, the last way, how does this victory, um, how does this guarantee of victory, uh, how does it encourage us? Well, Matthew 16 is saying that who is going to be the one to build the church? I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So there is a sense in which we are doing it. Right? We are the body, and God is the one gifting us, and we're working out uh, that. But, but there's another, and I think more profound and even more true sense, in which God is building his church. Jesus himself, risen from the dead with a physical body, rising into the third heaven, is directing and building his church. All authority has been given to him, and he is accomplishing it. And so what that means is that we become a gloriously small deal, okay? It, what, what, if you believe that the church is glorious, then one of the dangers is that you feel like what you're building is too big, is too important, is too glorious for you to try to build it, right? That you're too small of a, of a you know, you're not gifted or skilled enough to, to do that, right? And that would be true if you were a really big deal, <laughs> But if Jesus is the one that has promised he's going to build his church, and this is a worldwide thing that he's doing, here's here's a prayer that I often pray, and I just find so much encouragement from it, right? I think about the fact that we are a small church, 
in a small town and a small state. <laughs> and that we are, we're just gloriously small. Not that we're not loved, not that God doesn't see us, not that I don't love our church, but we are gloriously not a big deal in the grand scheme of things. And even if I royally screw everything up, like that would be bad. That would be really painful. I would cry, okay? Um, but I'm not gonna screw up God's eternal plans. You know what I'm saying? Does that make sense? Like when you guys are the ones that are leading, you actually need to have this deep down in your bones that you can't screw it up. You're not a big enough deal. That'll free you up to, to, to actually lead and take some risks. Maybe lead before you feel like you're ready, right? Maybe open the word and share that thing with that person or do the thing that you're not sure what to do, right? Because even if you do royally screw everything up, you cannot negate this promise that he will build his church and the gates of hell won't prevail against it. If the gates of hell, hell won't prevail against it, you certainly won't. The church will be built. His purposes will be accomplished. And that's a glorious, glorious, good thing. We probably won't see it in this life. That's my guess, right? I'm showing my cards a little bit there. We probably won't see it in this life. And yet, it is such a worthy thing for us to pour our lives out for the generations that come after us, right? Like none of your labor is in vain. Healthy, godly, strong churches are blessings to people. They make healthy, strong disciples after you. And so when you pour your heart out into building this church, you might not see where it's going or what's coming or how it's gonna end, but the people that are like just being born now or that are young or that are even in high school, right? You laboring in Campus Fellowship, you laboring in Walnut Creek, you laboring in Stonebrook, you laboring in Vintage Faith Church, it might bear fruit far down the road more than you could ever really know, right? We're all standing on the shoulders of men and women that came before us. And because we have the guarantee of victory, it's, it's, uh, it, it's, it's guaranteed your work is not in vain. And so here's, I just wanna close with this story. I don't know how much time I got, but I'm gonna close with this story. Um, one of the things that I think is just kind of shocking, kind of stunning to me, is that people used to build cathedrals. That's stunning. Like, just think about it for a second, all right? You're in your local church, okay? And somebody comes up with an idea. Guys, I got a plan, new building, <laughs> okay? And like, okay, yeah, I kind of like our building, but maybe we could use a new building, okay? And they're like, okay, here's what I'm thinking. It's gonna take a thousand years to build. <laughs> we'll all be dead. We'll never see it done. <laughs> it's gonna cost millions of dollars. We don't even actually really have the technology to, to complete it right now. We'll figure it out as we go. <laughs> right? What do you say? And here's what's crazy. Apparently, in the, like, like in the medieval period, tons of people said, yeah, <laughs> let's do that, <laughs> right? And then think about it, like you're the architect, okay? And, and you make the plans knowing for sure you're never going to see it finished, you're the first person laying that foundation, knowing for sure you're never going to see it built, right? You're cutting that stone, knowing you're never going to see the full fruit of your labor. Why in the heck would you ever devote your life, your money, right? Your plans, your labor, your hard work, your expertise to something that you'll never see done. The only reason you would do it is, I, I guess two reasons, it, it, if you had such a large view of God's glory. You just wanted him to be profoundly glorified and, and something that would only take your lifetime to build isn't big enough, right? You just want him to be glorified. Or two, hopefully, you know, if you want your own glory, but that's hopefully not what's happening, right? Or two, you so love your kids and your grandkids and their grandkids that you're thinking, I'm investing my life into this for my great, great, great grandson that maybe you'll be able to worship in here one day. Isn't that amazing? And when you pour your life out into building your local church, there's a sense in which you might be doing something like that for your own grandkids. I know we don't think that way, right? We're only thinking about our life in the next 10 years. And I think there's reasons for that, but I think it's healthy for us to think down the road. 
think for us healthy, for us to think generations down the road, right? And even if it's not your kids, let's say your kids move somewhere else and go to some other church, right? You're, you're, you're building for somebody's kids, right? You're investing in a healthy culture. You're building a better ministry. You're helping in the preaching of the word. You're, all of the things that you're doing are not in vain. God is building his church through you. And as that church is built, it is a blessing to more and more people. You have no idea the ramifications that it might have down the road. And so here's what I want you to take to heart, guys. Please take this to heart. God's church is glorious. It's glorious, far more than you realize. It's like an army with banners. It's the bride of Christ. It's what displays his glory and excellence, giving up your money, your time, yourself, is not in waste for God's local church. It's not a waste at all. And not only that, but it's a labor that he assures, he promises in the grand scheme of things, things will, 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 you'll see the victory, you'll see the success. It's a guaranteed investment. Oh man, if that's true, then you should probably go brew some coffee. You should probably hold some crying babies right? If that's true, you should probably greet some people with a smile. If that's true, you should probably study as hard as you can so that you can preach as hard as you can. You should probably evangelize and love and pray and serve and kill that pride and kill that flesh that's going to ruin that. Kill that division between your brother that's going to ruin that. And instead, with love and joy, look ahead to what God is building and just be shocked and awed that you get to be a part of it at all. That would be a wonderful thing. Amen? Okay, I love you guys. Let's pray one last time. And